The alien agenda is a complex question. In the program Alien Agenda, we reviewed whether aliens are visiting Earth, expert opinions, and their reasons to consider our planet important. After careful analysis, the determination was there does appear to be an extraterrestrial presence on Earth and an agenda in place. In this program, Alien Agenda Into the Future, we will explore this question further using fact-based information. The conclusions may be startling. Is Earth in the process of being invaded? Do governments of the world know about it? And are we all doomed to be pawns in their alien agenda? The Earth contains a multitude of unique minerals, life, and liquid water. Most of this could be obtained by any spacefaring species from other planets and asteroids throughout the galaxy. However, liquid water and life are apparently rare. We have both. There are a plethora of living beings on Earth, from simple amoeba to humans. 75% of the Earth is covered with liquid water. Our world has an atmosphere and temperature to sustain a variety of species as long as they are carbon-based and as long as they breathe oxygen. This makes the Earth a perfect target. Any species looking to colonize, conquer, or explore would find our Earth irresistible. It's a one-stop shop for everything you would need. Though we do not take care of it as well as we should, it is our only home, and we depend on its resources for our own existence. Other worlds may have water in the form of ice, but an alien species would have to expend their own resources to mine, gather, distill, and turn the ice into drinkable water. The same is true with any minerals they may need. Why expend your own resources when it's here and ready to exploit? Why gather it yourself when a perfectly pliable human race is here, ready to be conquered and can do the work for you? Why go looking for it across a vast galaxy, searching planet to planet for everything you need when you can come here and easily get anything your species may require? No matter what level of intelligence you are, what reasoning process you use, and what ethical and moral codes you subscribe to, there is one constant in the universe, and that is, the easy way is always the best. Work smarter, not harder. As humans throughout history, we have done the exact same thing. Our species expanded to cover every inhabitable continent on this earth. We have enslaved, conquered, had our slaves fight and do the work for us, and wiped out whole cultures and nations during our growth. We ourselves have been the aliens in a new world, spreading out, colonizing, killing, and ultimately controlling various populations around the planet. And we continue to do it. If they have something we want, we take it and push them out into reservations or worse, exterminate them. So why would we think they are any different from us? After all, we are an intelligent species and a spacefaring race as well. We are competitive, resourceful, and driven to explore invent and expand all the things necessary to reach new worlds yet we have this belief that they are better than us and to meet another being from another planet would be awesome 
it may not. Have we been conditioned to believe this in spite of our own self-preservation and intelligence? As humans, we tend to think of aliens as angels, benevolent beings who will come to save us, give us technology, cure our illnesses, and be our wonderful space brothers. We don't want to consider the alternatives. Why? Our own history began at a time when the Earth was inhabited by a multitude of plant and animal life and only one upright bipedal species, the Neanderthal. These cavemen were only beginning to grow and explore. Then something happened. Humans, just like us, began to appear on Earth. Suddenly, humans were present and today's scientists refer to this as the missing link. Somehow we either were brought here or were made using the DNA of Neanderthals or something else. When humans appeared, their brains had the capacity to think, learn, and grow. Those early humans were no different from us today. Their anatomy was the same. Their intelligence, the same. They are us. Various belief systems around the world have stories, myths, and legends as to how we arrived, from Adam and Eve to Native American legends that we came from beneath the earth. But in every story, in every legend, we humans came from somewhere else. We are not indigenous to this planet. So, how did we get here? If we examine our own recorded history and seek the earliest explanations via our own writings, we find that there was recorded history that explains this. This history was recorded by the Sumerians. The Anunnaki are a group of deities of the ancient Sumerians, Assyrians, and Babylonians. In the earliest Sumerian writings about them, which come from the post akkadian period, the Anunnaki are deities in the pantheon, descendants of An and Kai, the god of the heavens and the goddess of earth, and their primary function was to decree the fates of humanity. According to Sumerian text, we were genetically created by the Anunnaki, a space-faring race that needed us to work for them. After going through various genetic experiments that resulted in hybrids of man and animal, the final results were what we are now, humans. Apparently, the Anunnaki created several species of hybrids using genetics and crossbreeding to finally end up with a species like the Neanderthal, but much more intelligent and capable of behaving and working for them. Of course, they were viewed as gods. Being an advanced intelligent race, the Sumerians had no other recourse but to think of them as godly. Once humans were created, we multiplied quickly. No one knows who the original Adam and Eve were, but most all belief systems still in existence today agree that a god or gods came, made man, and we became the dominant intelligent species on the planet. So who were the Anunnaki? Over a series of published books, starting with Chariots of the Gods in 1968, pseudo-archaeologist Eric von Doniken claimed that extraterrestrial ancient astronauts had visited a prehistoric Earth. Donican explains the origins of religions as reactions to contact with an alien race and offers interpretations of Sumerian texts and the Old Testament as evidence. In his 1976 book, The Twelfth Planet, author Zachariah Stitchin claimed that the Anunnaki were actually an advanced humanoid extraterrestrial species from the undiscovered planet Nibiru who came to Earth around 500,000 years ago and constructed a base of operations in order to mine gold 
after discovering that the planet was rich in the precious metal. According to Sitchin, the Anunnaki hybridized their species and Homo erectus via in vitro fertilization in order to create humans as a slave species of miners. Sitchin claimed that the Anunnaki were forced to temporarily leave Earth's surface and orbit the planet when Antarctic glaciers melted, causing the Great Flood, which also destroyed the Anunnaki's bases on Earth. These had to be rebuilt, and the Anunnaki needed more humans to help in this massive effort, so they taught mankind agriculture. Of course, both of these authors are disputed by mainstream science. To scientists, the Anunnaki were just made-up mythological gods created by the culture of those times. If they are simply creations of the people of ancient Earth, they sure spent a lot of time making up the mythology. There were several Anunnaki, each with different names. They even described the clothes they wore and the personality of each one. To the Sumerians, these were real people of high stature and intelligence, and they ruled over the land with powerful technology. It's also possible that a race of extraterrestrials came to Earth and assumed the role of these mythological gods so that man would worship them and do their bidding. Perhaps they changed us so we would look upon them as superior and if they return, we would welcome them. In any case, there is a missing link, the sudden appearance of anatomically modern man from the Neanderthal. Could it be the Anunnaki, or some extraterrestrial race brought us to Earth, or made us from genetic material and species already here? Was this their agenda, and is it still ongoing today? Throughout history, references to E.T. are actually quite common, from frescoes and paintings in the Middle Ages to reliefs of alien craft and even aliens themselves appear within the pyramids of Egypt, as well as other monuments around the world. From small figurines to larger statues, we find evidence to non-humans scattered across the landscape of our world like litter. Every ancient culture has some representations of these beings, and oral or written history of their arrival or times they existed alongside man. If we look at today's modern UFO sightings, one could easily say they never left us. They have been here all along. Only the way we interpret them changes from culture to culture and time to time. In our world today, we look at technology to determine intelligence. When people observe something in the sky that appears to dismiss our understandings of physics, propulsion, and flight capabilities, we attribute it to some advanced beings that are further along than we are because we cannot duplicate those capabilities. We don't necessarily subscribe godly powers to these beings, only that they appear to be more advanced. Our modern cultures interpret within the guidelines of our science, so appearing as gods to us might not work today, but appearing as advanced aliens would, and therefore we are still in awe of them. It's entirely possible that this is part of their agenda as well. We have our religious beliefs and would resist strongly if they came and tried to appear as our deities. Add to this, there are several major religions around the world, each unique and different, 
it's unlikely they could appear as all of them and influence us into doing their bidding. Therefore, actual direct and open contact with us would not be part of their agenda. Remaining covert and elusive would work and they could come here, take a few humans, do their genetic research, and do with it what they please with no effect on our cultures at all. This fits what is going on today with our modern UFO mystery. The modern UFO mystery began with Foo Fighters seen by pilots during World War II, the apparent crash of a UFO near Roswell, New Mexico, and the beginnings of reports of alien abductions. Betty and Barney Hill were an American couple who claimed that they were abducted by extraterrestrials in a rural portion of the state of New Hampshire from September 19th to 20th in 1961. The incident came to be called the Hill Abduction and the Zeta Reticuli Incident because of a star map shown to Betty Hill could possibly be the Zeta Reticuli system, according to some researchers. The Hill case is one of the most extensive UFO abduction cases researched and studied. It has been validated in many ways from physical evidence, hypnosis, astrological research of the map Betty described and other methods. During their abduction, Betty revealed two important and startling things. One was the star map itself and the other was a pregnancy test she underwent conducted by the aliens. According to Betty, the aliens performed this pregnancy test on her. As she described it, this type of test would not be invented until much later. Taking genetic material from a subject is consistent with modern and ancient accounts of ET. The star map she described would not be discovered as real actual stars until 1969 in the arrangement and alignment she drew. There is no way Betty could have known of this specific star pattern in 1961, nor a genetic method to procure ovum specimens for a pregnancy test, as she called it. This test would not be invented until years later and not put into practical use till much later. As far as we know, we are the only human race in the universe. Surely there are other species, but if we were genetically created centuries ago, then we would now be unique to Earth. This holds true if we evolved here as well. Our biology has adapted to this planet over the eons we have lived here. That fact alone makes us another specific commodity that can only be found here on this planet. We, as a unique species, would be an important factor if an alien race were searching the galaxy for potential resources. As we explore the testimony of various alien abductees, we find that these aliens appear to be very interested in our biology. Almost all abduction cases mention or are centered around our specific anatomy. Many alien abductions seem to be centered around the creation of alien hybrids. Could the genetic creation of humans still be going on? Could aliens now be harvesting genetic material from us, a species made for this purpose? Or are aliens of different races simply taking yet another resource unique to our planet? Are we the major commodity of Earth?
alien abduction refers to the phenomenon of people reporting the experience of being kidnapped by an unusual figure subjected to physical and psychological experimentation. People claiming to have been abducted are usually called abductees or experiencers. Typical claims involve forced medical examinations that emphasize the subject's reproductive systems. Abductees sometimes claim to have been warned against environmental abuses and the dangers of nuclear weapons, or they have been engaged in interspecies breeding. Reports of the abduction phenomenon have been made all around the world, but are most common in English-speaking countries, especially the United States. However, there is little doubt that many apparently stable persons who report alien abductions believe their experiences were real. Many psychologists have assessed that while psychopathology was associated with some cases, most reports were from sane, common people. Some abduction reports are quite detailed. An entire subculture has developed around the subject with support groups and a detailed mythos explaining the reasons for abductions. The various aliens, greys, reptilians, Nordics, and so on are said to have specific roles, origins, and motivations. Abduction claimants do not always attempt to explain the phenomenon but some take independent research interest in it themselves and explain the lack of greater awareness of alien abductions as the result of either extraterrestrial or governmental interest or cover-ups. Researchers David M. Jacobs and Bud Hopkins argue that there was an elaborate process underway in which aliens were attempting to create human-alien hybrids. The most advanced stage of which in the human hybridization program are known as hybrids, though the motives for this effort were unknown. There had been anecdotal reports of phantom pregnancy related to UFO encounters at least as early as the 1960s, but Hopkins and especially Jacobs were instrumental in popularizing the idea of widespread systematic interbreeding efforts on the part of the alien intruders. The precise number of alleged abductees is uncertain. One of the earliest studies of abductions found 1,700 claimants, while contested surveys argued that 5 to 6 percent of the general population may have been abducted. UFO and alien-related conspiracy theories emerged in far-right politics from the 1980s onward till today. Most people alleged alien abductions report invasive examinations of their bodies, and some ascribe psychological trauma to their experiences. One procedure reported occurring during the alleged examination phase of the experience is the insertion of a long needle-like contraption into a woman's navel. Some have speculated that this could be a form of laparoscopy. Post-abduction syndrome is a term used by abductees to describe the effects of abduction though it is not recognized by any professional treatment organizations. People who have been abducted by aliens develop symptoms similar to post-traumatic stress disorder. The curious thing about almost all abductions is the physical examination phase when the aliens take samples such as ovum or sperm. Could they be checking on our progress? or taking genetic materials to use to create more hybrids or even more humans to do their bidding. Is it possible that there is a place or planet out there 
somewhere in the galaxy where a new breed of humans are being kept and used for alien purposes, a new colony, or a new slave race. According to the Name Us database, there are 600,000 people declared missing every year. Alongside that statistic, there are 4,400 unidentified bodies discovered every year. That means that only 0.7333% of people who go missing are found and unable to be identified. The others are either found or they are not. Where did these people go? Some may be living off the grid, while others are simply living under an assumed name or hiding. But what of the others? Is it possible that these people are no longer on Earth? Could they, or some of them, be alien abductees? We know the alien abduction phenomenon is happening. But these cases are few, and only those that get reported get reviewed and studied. To collect a cross-section of genetic material, you would need a larger number of people to sample. Perhaps this number of missing people are part of their plan. If people are being taken and kept, where are they? According to the Sumerians, we are a slave race made to serve our alien creators. Could some ongoing program be still in place whereby we humans are taken, studied, and harvested? We only know about alien abductions from those who were returned. The alien agenda may be much larger than a few who were abducted and brought back to tell the tale. These statistics also conceal more. Globally, 607 people go missing every single day without a trace. Over a year, this totals 221,644 missing individuals. Over 20 years, this totals over 4 million, more than the population of New Zealand and almost the entire population of Ireland, according to 2011 statistics. If only 2% of these missing people are being abducted within some extraterrestrial agenda, that is thousands of people that have completely disappeared from the earth and may be dead, slaves, or part of some new race being trained or evolved on another planet. There's also a more sinister and revolting possibility they may be food for an alien species. Is it possible that we humans may not be considered intelligent and we are little more than cattle for them? A species indigenous to this planet that can't be found anywhere else, but offers them a commodity to buy, sell, and trade, even consume. We view intelligence based on a species' ability to create. What if they don't? The alien mind may be very different from our way of thinking. For example, if the aliens view intelligence based on self-discipline rather than creativity, then we lose hands down every time. Humans are flamboyant, competitive, warlike, cruel, and destructive. We build great architecture, then blow it up in a conflict. We create music, art, and paintings, but do little to preserve it all. We are probably the least self-disciplined species in the galaxy. We soil our nest. We do not take care of the planet we live on, polluting every river, stream, and all the oceans. We eat toxic food and contaminate the good food we could eat with pesticides. 
and we appear to love conflict and war. On any given day, there is a war happening somewhere on the planet. We fight for, then squander our resources. If they consider intelligence by some other criteria, such as self-discipline, we would appear to them as no more than a lower life form, or maybe even unintelligent. Their thinking could be very different, such as they may take the stance that a beaver can build a dam, a bird can build a nest, and ants can build a mound. Building something may not be important to their way of judging intelligence. Creativity may be the start of intelligence, but to truly be considered intelligent, then you must also apply self-discipline to the process. You must take care of your creations, take ownership of your planet and not squander it. Create art and hold it high. You must get along with your fellow man and show reverence to their creations. You must be disciplined enough to take responsibility for life and all of your creations and environment. And any technologies you create should be used to benefit and advance mankind, not make war or divide the populations. You should consider yourselves one people not divided nations and ideologies to fight over. If aliens judge us by themselves, and they are more advanced than us, then we may appear to be little more than an abusive species that needs to be genetically purified or simply used. If an alien race approached Earth and listened to our broadcasts, watched us and studied us, they may be appalled. We would likely be judged as too destructive to work with and therefore not worth the time it would need to reach a point where our two species could be beneficial to work together. Or they may see us as little more than parasites infesting the planet and determine we may be useful only as some other commodity, such as food or genetic materials to work with. Perhaps they want to breed all this negativity out of us or make us into something that they can use or even consume. The extraterrestrial thought process is the key to understanding their alien agenda. The only thing we have to compare their agenda to is our own agendas. Therefore, we base our opinions on how we as humans would react. If their agenda is so foreign to us, we can't phantom their reasoning, we may be missing the point completely. For example, if invasion of some type is their agenda, then why take so long? The modern study of UFOs has been going on over 70 years. If they are planning to take over or invade, then they have had more than enough time to do it. Extend that back to ancient times when sightings occurred as often or more than today. They could have invaded multiple times. Perhaps we're looking at the puzzle the wrong way. If we are part of a long-term experiment, then the time factor is reasonable. If we are simply a garden to pick from, then time isn't a factor. You would want your garden to continuously grow and produce fruit. Like a tree you plant that produces a new crop every year. In that respect, we may be some kind of ancient garden reproducing new fruit to choose from every generation. Is it possible that we are some kind of biological experiment? Perhaps we are unimportant, but the viruses and bacteria that thrive within us is what they want. Since we live in a polluted world, we have adapted and produced antibodies within ourselves to survive in this hostile planet's environment. This too would make us unique. 
We are just the petri dish that contains all the organisms they need to build up their own antibodies so they can survive in hostile environments as well. In this scenario, we are their lab rats. In this case, they would not want nor need to contact us. Instead, they would want us to continue as we are because the more we pollute our own environment, the better vessels we are for their needs. The world's first nuclear explosion occurred on July 16, 1945, when a plutonium implosion device was tested at a site located 210 miles south of Los Alamos, New Mexico, on the plains of the Alamogaro bombing range. The code name for the test was Trinity. Hoisted atop a 100-foot tower, a plutonium device called Gadget detonated at precisely 5.30 a.m. over the New Mexico desert, releasing 18.6 kilotons of power, instantly vaporizing the tower and turning the surrounding asphalt and sand into green glass. Seconds after the explosion, an enormous blast sent searing heat across the desert, knocking observers to the ground. Reports from witnesses came from as far as 200 miles away. A forest ranger 150 miles west of the blast said he saw a flash of fire, an explosion, and black smoke. An individual 150 miles north said the explosion lit up the sky like the sun. The success of the Trinity test meant an atomic bomb could be used by the U.S. military and it marked the start of the atomic age. The EMP, or electromagnetic pulse from this detonation, would have traveled at the speed of light throughout the solar system and beyond. It would mark a definite change in our technology at the time. Any space-faring race would have easily picked it up especially if we were already under close scrutiny at the time. The radiation would be evident and they would know that we now have a devastating new weapon in our arsenal. This event alone would be cause for more intense investigation and observation by alien species interested in us and our planet. The explosion of a nuclear device also marks the modern study of UFOs because it was at this time more and more UFOs began to be reported and observed throughout the United States and around the world. A steady stream of recorded sightings have continued since 1947. It is likely we had already been under observation for a very long time. However, this one single event would change everything. It would appear we got their attention. Atomic energy is incredibly destructive and lethal. Radiation alone is horrible, and a detonation of significant magnitude can cause a rip in the space-time continuum. It produces high-energy radio bursts that affect electronics and can kill instantly. And we humans were playing with it like some new and exciting toy. Indeed, soon after the initial explosion tests, we dropped two devices on cities in Japan. To this day, we still do not fully understand nuclear power, but like any new discovery, we are quick to use it with no regard to how lethal and enormous its effects can be. 
Only now we are beginning to understand how this invention can affect space and time itself long after it has already been used to power our world. We are still learning how to contain it and use it responsibly. Chernobyl, Three Mile Island, and Fukushima are examples of our misuse and inability to contain this awesome and powerful material. Since 1950, there have been 32 nuclear weapon accidents, known as broken arrows. A broken arrow is defined as an unexpected event involving nuclear weapons that result in the accidental launching, firing, detonating, theft, or loss of the weapon. To date, six nuclear weapons have been lost and never recovered. What do you think the extraterrestrials would think of this new element introduced into the hands of a species that can't get along with each other, not to mention them? A species with no self-discipline, no regard for health, and no interest in responsibility. closer observation of this human species and perhaps some intervention might be in order. And thus, a new wave of UFO and alien sightings began. As soon as we developed nuclear capabilities, we began using it. Nuclear bombs, nuclear submarines, nuclear aircraft carriers, nuclear power plants. We began using it before truly exploring its potential and destructiveness. Naturally, other nations figured it out as well and began their own race to oblivion. But our fascination with nuclear weapons and power didn't stop there. We also began exploring biological weapons and diseases. The Center for Disease Control, or CDC, began soon after, as well as the World Health Organization and other facilities that have worked on enormously lethal biological agents and viruses with an aim to weaponize them. We are like children who have been handed a rifle to play with and we don't have the intelligence to truly understand and respect such power. This would be a major issue for an alien race studying us. Is it possible they wanted all of this to occur? They want us to develop and introduce such horrors into our own people? Or are they concerned about us and how we grow to better understand what we have created? Is all of this part of the alien agenda. It is very likely that there isn't one single alien race interested in us. The alien agenda may not be a single plan. It may be multiple plans from many different races. Some of these agenda may be for our benefit, while others may be malevolent. From our point of view, it is difficult to tell the difference. If this is the case, then there may be disputes among the aliens as to just what to do with us. 
Leave us alone and let us sort it out ourselves. Intervene and try to educate us. Or just simply wipe us out as a terrible experiment that can't be saved. We may not be considering that our behavior is being debated in some cabal out there that will ultimately decide if we have a future or not. Perhaps we are being given a chance to redeem ourselves, or plans to remove us from the galaxy are being determined. There could also be different agendas that are independent to each race and they are not working together but simply carrying out their own agendas with their own individual purposes. If the story of the Anunnaki is true, then this may have been planned all along. They want to see how far we will advance. Perhaps they expected us to develop atomic and biological weapons just to see what we would do with them. Perhaps they have been keeping track of our progress for centuries and this is just one of many developments along the way toward our eventual growth as an intelligent race. Or perhaps this inevitable outcome was just what they wanted. A race of humans ready and willing to fight and develop horrible devices to kill, maim, and utterly destroy anything that they are told is wrong. The ultimate soldiers? Beings they can unleash on their enemies with no regard to culpability? We certainly fit that bill. Humans will fight over almost anything. However, if we are a work in progress, then they may think this is a natural and normal part of our growth. Perhaps we will eventually work out our negative idiosyncrasies, begin to take better care of our Earth, and become a viable and benevolent race of star-traveling peoples ourselves. Could this be the plan? Let us go through all the hard times and the difficult experiences so perhaps one day we learn from them and can better exist in a universe teeming with a multitude of races and their own particular ways. If humans are to be a spacefaring race, we would need to learn not only to get along with ourselves, but all the different cultures out there and respect their ways of doing things. Perhaps the aliens are not the problem. Perhaps the problem is us. In the late 1800s, the spiritualist movement began whereby social events of a community would be to have a seance and try to contact the dead. By the 1930s, this was all the rage and spirit photography began. The social movement to try and contact spirits and to better understand ourselves through paranormal and spiritual methods was taking hold. The 1960s brought the New Age movement. Hippies and self-awareness was being explored by the youth and others who felt a need to improve us and our way of thinking. Since then, we as humans have been moving deeper into a spiritual understanding of ourselves and the cosmos. There has been more focus towards Eastern religions and philosophy continuing till today. It has permeated our politics, beliefs, and religious ideas, and today, many New Age self-improvement methods and practices can be found openly and in all of our older belief systems. While we are building atomic bombs, biological weapons, and advancing technologically, we were also looking inward and to the spirit world for more answers. Aliens and UFOs are an integral part of this New Age philosophy. 
Many people now accept aliens as part of a larger universe and are accepted as beings greater and lower than us. Some subscribe to having alien experiences where an alien talks to them, gives them advice, or is a spiritual master of some type. New Age religions, philosophy, or methods abound today. More and more people equate aliens to angels and guardians or spiritual masters. Within the beliefs, there are space brothers and a galactic federation of allied aliens who watch over the Earth. Some believe they receive messages from these aliens and are given predictions to what is coming for mankind. One of the most striking innovations within contemporary North American spiritualism is the adoption of extraterrestrials as spirit guides by some contemporary spiritualists. It is here that the New Age fascination with extraterrestrials and UFOs has taken on a uniquely spiritualist form. Extraterrestrials have come to represent for many spiritualists the successful achievement of the ultimate spiritualist goal, the union between spirituality and science. Extraterrestrials are seen as spiritually superior to us because their science exceeds our own. Their science is perceived superior because it incorporates recognition of spiritual truth. Consequently, within the North American Spiritualist Contest, the adoption of extraterrestrials as spirit guides can be seen both as rationalization of spiritualist belief through a strong idealization of science and as a critique of orthodox science for ignoring the spiritual realm. As with all religions and beliefs, there is a light side and a dark side. The Space Brothers are benevolent and are trying to help mankind, but there are also draconian empires that have their own agenda and plans for us. Aliens appear to be Nordic or human-like in the Brotherhood, with the Greys as servants or biological robots. The greys are a lower life form. In the dark side, the draconian aliens are reptilian and either evil or uncaring. Star people, sometimes called indigo children, are a variant of the belief in alien-human hybrids in New Age belief in French theory. Introduced by Brad Steiger in his 1976 book, Gods of Aquarius, it argues that certain people originated as extraterrestrials and arrived on Earth through birth or as a walk-in to an existing human body. Reptilians, also called reptoids, Syrians, draconians, or lizard people are reptilian humanoids which play a prominent role in ufology and conspiracy theories. The idea of reptilians was popularized by David Icke, a conspiracy theorist who claims shape-shifting reptilian aliens control Earth by taking on human form and gaining political power to manipulate human societies. He has stated on multiple occasions that many world leaders are or are possessed by reptilians. The reptilians are tall, blood-drinking, shape-shifting reptilian humanoids from the Alpha Draconis star system, now hiding in underground bases and are the force behind a worldwide conspiracy against humanity. These conspiracy theories now have supporters in up to 47 countries with seminar lectures to crowds of up to 6,000 people. Some adherents of the QAnon conspiracy theory have also borrowed from the reptilian conspiracy theory, including elements shared in anti-Semitic conspiracy theories. In ufology, Nordic alien is the name given to humanoid extraterrestrials purported to come from the Pleiades, who resemble 
Nordic Scandinavians. Professed contactees describe them as being six to seven feet tall, with long blonde hair, blue eyes, and fair skin. Scholars note that the study of extraterrestrial visitation from beings with features described as Aryan often include claims of telepathy, benevolence, and physical beauty. If any of this is true, then we have at least two types of aliens with their own agendas observing Earth and its population. Both appear to be interacting with us, either spiritually or infiltrating our governments. There may be others with more sinister plans. A former Army sergeant who worked at NATO, Clifford Stone, has said 57 alien species have been cataloged by the government. That was in 1989, and there could be more now. Other ufologists believe over 70 different species. However, the government denies this. Like the popular television show Star Trek, there could be a federation of planets and aliens in our galaxy, and we are too primitive to join. Therefore, as in the TV show, they have a non-interference policy and do not contact us openly. All contact with us is done covertly. Abductions and experiments may be part of their covert agenda as they study and determine our level of intelligence, technology, and biology. Something like this seems to be ongoing because to date, no aliens have landed and asked to be taken to our leaders. The other possibility is there has been direct contact with our government and individuals within the government know exactly who the aliens are, have had direct contact, and there are agreements in place whereby they share technology for the rights to take a few humans for their own purposes. Some say this type of agreement has been in place since the 1950s when President Eisenhower met with them personally. Eisenhower was on a golf vacation in Palm Springs on February 20th, 1954. After dinner that night, he made an unscheduled departure from the Smoking Tree Ranch where he was staying. The next morning, he attended a church service in Los Angeles. Also that morning, his spokesman announced to the press that he had visited a dentist the previous night because he had chipped a tooth while eating a chicken wing at dinner. Instead, Eisenhower was diverted to Edwards Air Force Base where he met with two ETs with white hair, pale blue eyes, and colorless lips. They had concerns about our nuclear program. These Nordic aliens offered to share their superior technology and their spiritual wisdom with Ike if he would agree to eliminate America's nuclear weapons. Sometime later in 1954, Ike reached a deal with another race of extraterrestrials known as the Greys, allowing them to capture earthling cattle and humans for medical experiments, provided that they returned the humans safely home. Since then, the Greys have kidnapped millions of humans. Of course, the government denies this story and says researchers can account for where he was that night. Many ufologists aren't buying it and they think he did meet on two occasions with extraterrestrials. Since the modern study of UFOs and UAPs, we have been fascinated by their level of technology. UFOs behave in a manner our technology cannot duplicate. 
The existence of alien UFO craft comes down to one logical conclusion. If we as humans are not able to develop a craft that can maneuver in the way UFOs do, then someone else must be manufacturing these craft. UFOs can fly in space, in the air, and under the sea. They display flight characteristics different and seemingly impossible from our craft. They defy gravity and inertia. They can appear and disappear at will. A multitude of UFO sightings display these flight capabilities. Capabilities that are beyond our level of technology. If no government on earth nor any corporation has achieved this, if America or Russia, China or the Middle East or any other nation can create a craft capable of all of these attributes and yet have no propellers, no jet engines, no wings or other aviation systems known to us, then the logical and inescapable conclusion is someone out there is manufacturing and flying these craft. That someone isn't us. So aliens must exist. Some may argue that all UFOs are misidentifications, hoaxes, or natural phenomena. Statistically, that is impossible. There is too much detail and even photographic evidence of these objects to explain all of them away with a simple nonsense answer. No sane person would conclude there is nothing to it given the wealth of information on the subject and the photographic and physical landing case data. Even whistleblower witnesses within the government have come forward verifying the existence of aliens and UFOs. It is their technology that astonishes us. These are craft that can float and fly with no visible signs of propulsion. Craft that are noiseless, have no wings, and appear to be able to go faster than sound without producing a sonic boom. They can make right angle turns at enormous speeds. Our craft have to arc to turn, and the resulting g-forces at high speed can kill the pilot. They can stop instantly with no discernible reaction to inertia. They display a level of technology our scientists, engineers, and aviation experts can only dream about. When we look at their technology, we must wonder who could be able to make and manufacture such a marvel of aviation. Just like our cars and trucks, there appear to be several models of these craft, each with its own unique style and design. There could be a single race making a variety of styles, or there are several races of aliens with their own styles. We simply do not know. What we do know is these craft do exist and are tracked by radar, visually identified and often seen with pilots or occupants inside. Recently, a variation of alien craft have been spotted by naval personnel, having a tic-tac or contact capsule design. They pursued our aircraft, were picked up on radar, and were even photographed by pilots and radar systems as well. And in each case, they outpaced our aircraft easily. These capsules could enter the water and exit into the air with ease. In 2022, new radar systems and technology were distributed to military bases guarding America. With this new technology, military facilities were able to pick up smaller objects and determine their exact locations. By 2023, a plethora of new UFO sightings occurred with the result of a Chinese spy balloon being detected and shot down on the East Coast. Three other unidentified craft 
were also shot down, but information about these objects were kept secret. Is it possible that one of them could have been an alien spacecraft? The shoot-down of the Chinese balloon made international news, and it difficult for the government to deny the existence of the other objects that it had detected and shot down. Objects they were unwilling to discuss. A noted general, when asked if the objects could be alien, answered that the government wasn't taking any possibility off the table. Since then, other nations have come forward and admitted they too have shot down balloons and other objects. One might ask the question, are we even capable of shooting down an alien craft of advanced technology? That would depend on the craft itself and if it were vulnerable to our weapons. A modern helicopter is far more advanced than a balloon, but both can be shot down. Perhaps their technology, though having advanced aviation capabilities, still remains physical and can be vulnerable to attack, just as our craft are. And if we were to attack or shoot down one of their craft, how would they react? In 1947, an alien craft crashed outside Roswell, New Mexico. The craft alien bodies and debris were recovered by our military. Apparently, there was no reaction by the aliens, at least not openly. There are also several stories that other craft may have been shot down. If so, there were no reactions from these incidents either. If we have recovered an alien craft after being shot down by our pilots or ground-based weapons, then the aliens either don't care or have negotiated secretly for the return of their technology. All nations take espionage seriously. Flying a craft over our airspace became an international incident with a simple balloon but it had advanced spy technology as its payload. America spent millions recovering that technology to further understand it, to see what the Chinese were looking for and listening to. The Chinese deny it was a spy balloon. However, they have made attempts covertly to recover it from the Americans, yet publicly they act unconcerned. This scenario may be indicative of how they may react if we shot down one of their alien spacecraft. Publicly, they would do nothing. However, privately and covertly, they may contact our government for the technology. And such contacts appear to have happened in modern times. If we do have classified channels in which our government and aliens can contact and negotiate with us, such channels would be very useful for both parties. It would allow both of us to exchange information, even technology, with no other nation or the public being the wiser. Is it possible that some of us, perhaps those in high government, are in on the alien agenda? Could we as a nation be part of this agenda, even supplying the aliens with what they need while we are getting something in return? Could government officials be selling out mankind for their own agenda? One thing to consider when asking the alien agenda question is are we sure it is us they are interested in? Perhaps we are simply another species on the planet and they are more interested in the planet as a whole than just us. 
Earth may be in some strategic position between other destinations, and stopping off here is like a waypoint to re-energize when traveling to their actual destination. In that case, we would be like a gas station between two distant points, and it's advantageous to stop here to refuel. Earth may contain some substance or energy we are unaware of, and they need it to run their ships perhaps something in our air that they need. It could be an electromagnetic property or other energy that is natural to our planet. If this is the case, then they may simply be passing through and they have little interest in us. However, if our advancements threaten their ability to use Earth as a waypoint, such as exploding atomic bombs, then they may begin to take a closer look at this awkward species who apparently has a fascination with war and destruction. Several UFO reports and sightings are near power stations and over water. Some cases even describe the UFOs apparently taking energy from our power grid and seemingly extracting something from our water sources. There may be a plethora of materials, elements, and substances here they can't get easily anywhere else. This would make our planet very important to their needs, and since we are not protecting it well, they may want to ensure we don't destroy it. After all, Earth is the only planet with life and resources all in one place for several light years. If we continue our destructive ways, they may decide at some point that they are better equipped to steward and control the planet for the betterment of all races. In this case, the aliens may be here to determine if we should be allowed to continue managing this world, or if they should take control to preserve it. There are many alien abduction cases where the abductee is shown destructive images, nuclear holocausts, and environmental disasters. Perhaps the aliens are trying to educate us, to teach us that our way is not working and it will end in an apocalypse if we continue. The genetic materials they take from abductees may be them growing a farm or catalog of us, so they may repopulate the planet after we've destroyed it. Or they may be creating a new colony on another planet, so when we all die out, there will be a place where humans can start again. If they are creating human and alien hybrids, then this may be a project where they can build a new race, a new species that can survive on Earth after the ecology is decimated. It is entirely possible that they see no hope for us, and all the ufology data we have learned from so far is simply us reviewing their attempts to preserve mankind. Their agenda may not be sinister, but a method to try and save us from ourselves. The aliens may be holding on to the genetic material they collect in order to repopulate the Earth with a new breed of humans, perhaps better, that will live and grow here after our generation has depleted the planet of its natural environment. Indeed, this may be an ongoing process that began with the Anunnaki and is continuing today. We could be a next generation of humans that were brought here from another world. We eventually destroyed, and we are now doing the same on Earth. When the Anunnaki made us, we could have been made from genetics they took from another world and have implanted us here to grow and multiply to see if we would do it again. We could be a failed experiment 
or one that needs adjusting so it can be done again on another world when we finally destroy ourselves. Or they may be waiting and hoping that this time around we learn and stop our destructive behavior. We could be their last hope. We could be the final stage in some long and ongoing experiment that they hope will eventually work out right. They could be watching and waiting to see if we will develop into an intelligent and self-disciplined race that will one day contribute to the betterment of the galaxy and bring our wisdom and technology to races as yet undiscovered. The alien agenda may be their attempts to wean out our destructive behaviors and build a new human that takes responsibility and can reach out into the galaxy with love and understanding. We could be their future and their legacy. To us, the UFO and alien agenda is a mystery. It's like trying to see the outside of the box from within. We can observe and catalog sightings and collect as much information as we can, but until there is some disclosure from the aliens themselves, we may never know their true agenda in our lifetimes. The governments of the world may know more or at least have additional data that we are not privy to, but even they may be ignorant to the true and full alien agenda. We cannot look to the government to disclose UFO information. After all, they too have their own agenda and often use the phenomenon to misdirect us or hide some clandestine project within the UFO mystery. True disclosure, if it ever happens, will come only from the aliens themselves at a time and place they choose when they believe we are ready. Until that day arrives, we can only hope the alien agenda is in our favor. If not, then we can only hope we never find out the truth. Six, five, four.